In the previous video, we concluded that we need to solve five integrals of very similar types in order to perform Gaussian filtering. In this video, we will look at these integrals in a bit more detail and give a high level explanation of common methods to approximate these integrals. We will use this as an introduction to the filtering methods that we will present in the next couple of videos. These filters make use of the so-called sigma point methods to perform Gaussian filtering. So, in the previous video, we concluded that in order to derive Gaussian filters using the moment matching principle, we need to solve integrals on this form. If we start by considering the prediction step, we need to approximate these two integrals in order to calculate the predicted mean and the predicted covariance. As you can see, they both have the same basic form, where we have a nonlinear function times a Gaussian density that we take the integral of. Now, in this first integral, we have f of xk minus 1, which is our nonlinear function. And in this integral here, we have f of xk minus 1 minus our predicted mean times the same thing transpose, which is our nonlinear function in this case. Please note that both these integrals here are expected values. And we can view, for instance, this integral here as the expected value of g of x, where x is distributed according to this Gaussian distribution. With this in mind, it might be a bit easier to understand the implications of the integrals here. So we have an expected value here, and then we have the covariance here, which can be expressed in terms of the expected value of this function here. Once we have computed or approximated these integrals, we approximate the predicted density using moment matching as a Gaussian with the mean and covariance that we get from these expressions here. Similarly, in the update step, we have these three integrals here that are also in the same form. All of these take a nonlinear function times a Gaussian, a nonlinear function times a Gaussian, and a nonlinear function times a Gaussian, just as we did in the prediction step. In this case, the integral calculates the predicted measurement, the cross covariance between the state and our measurement, and the covariance of our measurement, or the covariance of our innovation, which is the same. Once we have solved or approximated these components, we can approximate our posterior as Gaussian with this mean and this covariance that we get from using the ordinary Kalman filter update equations. To give a concrete example of what these integrals could represent, we can consider a sensor that measures the distance and angle to an object. If the sensor is located at the origin here, then the distance to the object is simply the square root of x1 squared plus x2 squared, and the angle to the object is just arcus tangus x2 over x1. So for our sensor, we have this measurement model here. To make things a bit simpler, we assume that we have no measurement noise, which is perhaps a bit unrealistic, but it's just for illustration purposes. If we assume that the object that we are measuring is Gaussian distributed with mean 2, 2, which is here, and this covariance, then a contour plot of this Gaussian density could look something like this. Now, let us consider what happens to the distribution of the measurements if x is distributed like this. When x is close to its mean, the angle here, theta, would be roughly pi over 4. So we take the angle like this. And the distance d is fairly close. Now, if x is out here, we have an angle which is larger, and the distance grows compared to what we had before. However, if x is here somewhere, the angle is fairly small, close to zero, but the distance grows again, right? So by following this argument, we can understand that p of y, the distribution of the measurement, has this type of banana-shaped density, which is clearly not your typical Gaussian shape. Now, computing and describing p of y analytically is rather complicated. So in order to compute the expected value of y, we instead make use of the distribution of x and the mapping h of x. So we write the expected value of y as this integral here, where we have h of x times the Gaussian density of x with parameters x hat and p dx. Now the question is, how can we solve this type of integral? Surely you're aware of the fact that there are many techniques to approximate integrals. In this case, however, the integrals represent expected values. And for expected values, there are special techniques that we can use. A very general and useful technique is the Monte Carlo method. The idea is simply to generate independent and identically distributed samples, x1 to xn, from p of x, 
and make use of the fact that expected values can be approximated by sampling averages in this case. So the expected value of g of x, where x is distributed according to p of x, is approximate 1 over n with the sum of g of xi. So we evaluate g at all the sample points. The reason why this is approximately the same as the expected value is because this is the sample average and according to the law of large numbers, this is asymptotically exact as you increase the sample size n. The Monte Carlo method is in fact very simple to use to perform Gaussian filtering. And as I said, it's asymptotically exact. But despite all this, it's still seldom used in practice. And one reason for that might be that you need to use quite large sample sets in order to get a good approximation. As an example of how the Monte Carlo method works, we can look at the example from the previous slide, where we have polar measurements. What we've done here is that we generate the sample from the Gaussian random variable x, and then map these through our nonlinear function h of x to get the corresponding distances and angles, which means that we obtained samples from y. As expected, you can see that the samples of y follow this banana-shaped density that we saw in the previous slide. Now, given these samples, it's simple to compute the sample average, which in this case is the red cross here. And if our sample size is sufficiently large, this will be a very good approximation of the expected value of y. The covariance of y can be approximated in a similar manner by setting g of x equal to h of x minus y hat times itself transpose, where y hat is the mean of y that we calculated here. So that is the Monte Carlo method. Now let's look at another set of methods that feels a bit similar but have much less computational complexity, but also gives less accurate results. Nonetheless, these methods are far more used to do Gaussian filtering than the Monte Carlo method, and these are the sigma point methods. All of the so-called sigma point methods that we will study in the next couple of videos makes use of something called stochastic decoupling. It turns out that it's easy to design integration methods when the elements in the random vector are independent. By using stochastic decoupling, we can express an integral of a general Gaussian random variable in terms of an integral with respect to a Gaussian random variable which is zero mean and has the identity matrix as a covariance matrix. The argumentation goes like follows. Suppose the square root of p is a matrix such that the square root of p times itself transposed is p. One way to find the square root is to use the so-called Scholesky decomposition which we get in MATLAB if we simply write shoal p and add lower. This will give us a lower triangular matrix, which has all zeros on the upper triangle, and then only values on the diagonal and on the lower triangle, like this. Now, we should perhaps note that the square root of a matrix is not unique. There are many different solutions for which this holds, and depending on which you use, you will get slightly different results. So keep this in mind later when you use these methods in your own filter implementations. Suppose now that we have a random vector psi, which is Gaussian, with zero mean and the identity matrix as a covariance matrix. As a minor remark, I would like to point out that we would later learn how to compute integrals with respect to this type of densities. If we then define a new random vector x, which is equal to x hat plus the square root of p times psi, and it's easy to see that the expected value of x is just x hat, since xi is zero mean. And the covariance of x is square root of p times i times the square root of p transpose. And this is just p. So x here is a Gaussian random variable with mean x hat and covariance p. And by writing it like this, we can describe any Gaussian random variable in terms of this simple Gaussian random variable, xi, that has zero mean and the identity matrix as a covariance matrix. In terms of our integrals used to compute our expected values, this means if we're interested in taking the expected value of g of x, which is distributed according to this Gaussian distribution, we can instead take the expected value of g of this variable here, where the expectation is taking over xi instead, which is zero mean and has the identity matrix as a covariance. The only thing that we have done here is that we have performed a change of variable in the integrations. We change from x 
to Xi using this relationship here. The conclusion from all of this is that it's sufficient to be able to compute integrals on this form. So we have the integral of a general function g of xi, which in the example here would be all of this. So we call this g of xi. So we take the integral of this type of function times this density, which is zero mean and has the identity matrix as a covariance. And if we can solve this, then we can do Gaussian filtering. And I would argue that this is easier to solve than of these integrals where we have general Gaussian distributions. Now I can understand if, at the moment, these results may look rather dry and boring, but we will soon show techniques to compute these integrals, and thanks to the results presented here, we will be ready to make use of them to perform filtering. So now finally to the sigma point method. So apart from the Monte Carlo methods, all integration methods covered here can be viewed as sigma point methods. The idea is to approximate the expected value of g of x as a weighted sum of g evaluated at a set of sigma points, xi, and weighted by its own weight, wi. At a first glance, this might seem very similar to the Monte Carlo approximation, but a key difference is the sigma points here are selected deterministically. And normally, there are not so many of them. For instance, if we return to the previous example with the sensor measuring the angle and the distance to an object, and this banana-shaped density. If we try to compute the expected value of y using a sigma point method called the uncentered transform, we would only select five sigma points, which would result in five different values of g of x, here marked with a yellow axis. If we then use these values of g of xi and the weighting factors to compute the expected value, we get this approximation here, which is not too far off from the true value. Now, there is not just one sigma point method, but there are many sigma point methods, each with its own peculiar name. So we have the uncentered transform, the cubiture rule, gauss hermite quadrature, Gaussian process quadrature, marginalized transform, and so on. Now, all of these have also been used in Gaussian filtering, and there are filters with equally peculiar names as they are named after the corresponding integration methods. So we have the uncentered karma filter, the cubital karma filter, the gauss hermite karma filter, Gaussian process karma filter, marginalized karma filter, and there are several more. So it's quite simple. You invent a new integration rule and you have a new filter. It also means that you can learn and understand several of these filters at the same time. In the next videos, we will present two integration rules and explain how these can be used for Gaussian filtering. The integration rules are the uncentered transform, which is perhaps the most commonly used sigma point method, perhaps because it was the first one to be promoted. Now there are variants of the uncentered transform that has several tuning parameters, which allow us to try to tailor its behavior to our specific problem, but it also makes it harder for us to work with it. The second integration rule is called the cubature rule, which is more recent than the uncentered transform, and is very similar, but even simpler. Compared to the uncentered transform, it uses one less point, and it has no tuning parameters, which in turn makes it simple and quite robust. So in the next couple of videos, we will explain how we can use these to do Gaussian filtering.